we're going to give a, a general overview of digital preservation activities at Tate and also introduce the Pericles project. Um, we'll summarise the use cases and the key challenges that we're presenting to the Pericles project. So I'll talk about the, the artwork use cases and then I'll hand over to John to talk about the archive use case. And then he'll also discuss the use of ontologies for describing and modelling artworks and their environments. So Tate holds the National Collection of British Art and International Modern and Contemporary Art. And the Tate Archive holds over a million records on British art from 1900 to the present. Uh, we have three sites in London at Tate Modern, Tate Britain and Tate Stores, as well as galleries in Liverpool and St Ives, and over a thousand staff in all. Um, we, we have a number of, sort of different categories of digital assets. Um, the first of which is the digital collection items themselves. So this includes born digital artworks and archives that are acquired into the collection in digital form. Um, so we've got an example here of a recently acquired digital video work and a software-based artwork in our collection. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, collection items that need to be migrated off um, tape and things into digital file-based formats. Um, we also have a large number of digitised copies of collection items. Um, so all of our art collection is accessible on, on the website and there was also a recent project to digitise a large portion of the Tate archive collection and make that accessible online through the same art and artist section of the website. Um, and then we also have a, a large number of other material that's produced by Tate over the course of their activities. So there's um, all the usual sort of internal documentation, um, images and recordings of events, um, a, a large, ever-increasing volume of conservation science data taken on very specialist equipment that we need to try and preserve, um, and a lot of content on social media and blogs on the website. Um, so, our overall approach to digital preservation, um, we, we have a digital preservation and continuity policy that um, kind of lays out those different categories and applies sort of different principles and responsibilities for each. Um, we have a training program for staff on digital asset management. Um, and introducing principles around metadata and digital preservation principles to staff. Um, so in 2013, we went out to tender for a digital storage system, um, and th that was all part of the Archives and Access project, the, the digitization project that was funded by the Heritage Lotteries Fund. Um, so Archivum, won the, the contract for that to implement a, an on-site version of their system. Um, so it's a system that has a, a high level of redundancy and um, resilience. So it's, it's different to a standard, um, sort of a standard IT storage system in that file integrity is constantly um, managed. It's replicated across Two, two sites at Tate plus a third offline copy. Um, so at each site there's the appliance that runs the, the software plus a disk layer and then um, a tape library. So the, the master copies of the artworks are, are held on ultimately on three, three copies of LTO tape. Um, but it's not, not just about storage, we also need to think about 
new processes for managing these new types of <coughs> material and developing systems to manage them. Um, digital video is one of the biggest challenges at the moment. We have approximately 500 video artworks in the collection. Um, so those have been um, migrated every seven to nine years onto, onto new, new stock and new formats. But the next, the next migration would need to be um, need to be onto digital file-based storage. So that requires a whole new processes and policies and systems to manage that. Um, so we have a pilot project underway at the moment on using Archivematica, which is an open source digital preservation system. I think Ben from MoMA will probably be talking more about shortly as they're using it as well. Um, but it's a system that we can use to package the artwork up with um, some metadata and run some sort of characterization tools and things like that on our collection. Um, and I think Fergus is here from Tate somewhere. Let's see him. Yeah, um, he's been working on that um, pilot project, so <laughs> you can ask him at lunchtime for any questions. So I'll move on to a brief introduction of the Pericles project. Um, this is a, a four-year EU-funded project that's um, addressing the challenge of long-term access to digital content in an evolving or changing environment. So it's um, involving 11 partners from, from lots of different fields. So we've got software engineers and um, semantics experts and digital humanists working alongside um, two use case providers. Um, it, it came out of a, an observation that digital objects and metadata are generated as, as part of a constantly changing environment and that this change might lead not only to loss of access or functionality but also to the general meaning and understanding of information. So it's incorporating cultural and semantic change as well as technical change. Um, it's taking a preservation by design approach, so embedding preservation into the design of data curation and records management practices. Um, it's looking at understanding the whole, the wider context around digital objects that will impact their their long-term term reuse and understanding. And it's taking a model-driven approach. So it's looking at representing the ecosystem of a digital object and using that to, to drive the processes that we need for digital preservation. So there's two use cases being provided to the project. Um, Tate is providing the media use case. Um, and then there's also the, the Belgian Space Centre, um, who's providing a science use case for the project. And Christian, I think, is, is here still today, so he'll be able to answer any questions about that side of the project. Um, so I'll briefly discuss the, the first two of the use cases. So the first one is digital video <coughs> artworks. Um, and here we're looking at the the challenge of inconsistent playback. So looking at um, a number of different factors that can affect the consistent playback of a file, particularly um, affecting the color and resolution and aspect ratio of, of the image. Um, and the dependencies which create these variations in playback include the, the behavior of different players and interpreting the file and container information, and that can often conflict. Um, so Dave Rice has, has written a, a really interesting paper about the significant characteristics um, relating to video playback. Um, he's identified um, several significant characteristics that, that need to be understood and documented in order to assess whether, um, 
whether a, a file is, is being played back successfully. Um, and he's outlined those in his report that's available on, on our website. Um, so as an example, I've got an example from um, a Gregorisco video artwork. Um, and this is where we have two video players identifying a video stream differently. And therefore it's using different um, codecs to read read the same file, and that's resulting in, in some changes to the color space and contrast errors. You can see where there's <laughs> quite different interpretations of the file. I think the one on the left is in VLC, and the one on the right is in QuickTime, I think. Um, so for software-based art, we're looking at the the complex relationships and, and dependencies. And for, for these kinds of artworks, it's often including external hardware and network components. Um, so to ensure the, the preservation of the intended behavior of these works, we need to be able to document and understand these dependencies as well as the intentions of the artist. Um, this is an example of a software-based art in our collection. Um, it's called Becoming by Michael Craig Martin. Um, and it's a computer-generated animation that um, is, is constantly changing in, in new compositions. Um, so although it's a, it's a relatively straightforward work, we have encountered issues. Um, where the, the speed of the changing composition has, has altered. Um, so one approach that we've um, taken with software-based art is virtualization. And Patricia, um, <clears throat> the time-based media conservator from Tate, has been doing some research along with Annette Decker on um, the use of virtual machines. Um, and this can be useful both as a, a diagnostics tool to help identify and document some of these technical dependencies, um, and also potentially as a, as a preservation strategy. Um, I think this has some limitations. Um, oops. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the significant properties have been captured accurately, so you still need to do some work on comparing the physical and virtual machines. Um, but I'm sure Patricia will be happy to answer any questions you have about that. Um, so I'll hand over now to um, John Langdon, who will speak about the archive use case. <coughs> Hi. Um, yep, so thank you, Anna. Um, so I'll now speak about the third use case that uh, Tate is supplying to the Pericles project, uh, which comes from uh, Tate Archive. And current work at the Archive within Pericles focuses on a set of issues surrounding the central challenge of the impact of technical change on archival cataloging. And this includes exploring the challenges to a particular aspect of professional practice, um, stemming from born digital material, uh, and also an assessment of significant properties for archival digital objects centered on a practical investigation looking at Archivematica, which Anna mentioned earlier. So we're exploring three main ways in which technical change has affected archive cataloging. These changes include the obvious changes in the types of material being cataloged, but also changes in cataloging systems uh, and in researchers' requirements, uh, all of which have implications for cataloging. So while archive cataloging is designed to be format agnostic, current standards were largely composed in a pre-digital world, uh, and they reflect the concerns of an archive profession whose practice is rooted in managing paper records. Although merely elements of a standard such as ISAD-G, the International Standard for Archival Description, are still relevant to digital material, there is additional information that it cannot capture, but which uh, is, is needed. So to give a simple example, ISAD-G allows for two types of date, 
uh, dates when records were accumulated or used, uh, and dates when documents were created. Um, and this situation becomes more complex when you start looking at digital material. So for example, a letter in the form of a word processed file can have several dates, including the file creation date, the file modified date, any date given in the text of the document itself, uh, as, well as, as well as other dates recorded in the metadata for the file. And any or all of these may well affect the way that the document is interpreted. And this situation becomes more complex uh, when one considers metadata for which there is no direct equivalent uh, in cataloging standards. And this metadata can often be technical metadata, and there are, of course, many standards available for capturing this. However, there is an interesting area where technical and archival descriptive metadata standards overlap, and I feel this is an area which has not received sufficient attention from archivists. There are important questions around how much technical information is required by the users of archival objects, uh, how this should be supplied, and how it should be linked to standards for descriptive metadata. So while technical change has clearly affected the types of object being described by archives, it has also affected archival description uh, and standards. For example, the move to online searchable databases can result in search results divorced from their context, unlike in a paper list where records are always contextualized. And this can pose a challenge to standards. For example, ISAG states that information should not be repeated at lower levels where it can be assumed to be inherited from higher levels. And this does, this does prevent repetition of information in a paper list where the context is clear. But in an online set of search results, it can produce archival descriptions that make little sense out of their context. This is a simple example, but it is important that the archive sector recognizes the importance of the interplay between standards and tools, and that it understands its requirements, and that it can influence future development. The final type of technical change that we are considering concerns users, uh, and its impact on the way in which users access archives. Providing access to archive material in digital forms opens the way for new research questions, and forms of analysis that are simply not practical with non-digital material, such as the use of the Old Bailey's uh, digitized records online to analyze the incidents of specific criminal charges, uh, or the analysis of edits stored in the files for uh, Jonathan Larson's musical Rent. And this shift raises a series of questions around the information that researchers will need about material, uh, and also the preservation actions that an archive has performed and the types of access that uh, archivists will now need to support. Uh, sorry. Um, Tate Archive is also conducting a more practical examination of significant properties uh, and of Archivematica uh, in relation to cataloging. This includes a uh, project to assess the degree to which significant properties are altered by Archivematica's workflows for file format migration, um, and we'll also consider the implications of this for archive cataloging. Archives will need to evaluate what information needs to be passed to researchers when producing access copies of digital material, and this will need to take into account the impact of any processing performed by the archive on significant properties, as this may affect the use, um, the use made of a digital object by a researcher or the conclusions that a researcher may draw. In addition, archives will need to consider how to capture this metadata where to store and manage it, uh, and how to present it to researchers, all of which will have an effect on archive cataloging practice. So overall, through exploring the impact on an aspect of professional practice, uh, the work at Tate Archive aims to explore a number of related issues around cataloging and enabling reuse, including the identification of significant properties and dependencies for born digital archive material, an examination of what information on these is needed by researchers, and methods for supplying this information to users within existing frameworks. So I now want to um, move on to look at the modeling approach being adopted within the Pericles project, which uh, Anna introduced earlier. As Anna said in her introduction, Pericles is employing a model-driven approach to digital preservation. The use cases supplied by Tate that we have just coved form the basis of a series of uh, domain ontologies 
which are combined with the linked resource model developed by Pericles to underpin a model of a digital ecosystem. So within computer and information science, an ontology is a formal machine-readable vocabulary that defines the entities that exist in a domain, providing a simplified conceptual model of a domain. <coughs> Pericles uses both an upper-level ontology, that is a model of the common objects that are generally applicable across multiple knowledge domains, uh, which is referred to within Pericles as the linked resource model, as well as multiple domain ontologies, that is, models of concepts that belong to a specific knowledge domain. This approach offers a number of advantages to the project. Ontologies formalize knowledge of a domain, ensuring that researchers work from a shared common understanding. They permit the reuse of domain knowledge, avoiding the need for researchers to repeat work done in other projects. And ontologies also support analysis and reasoning uh, from which new information can be inferred. They also support simulation uh, and predictions, uh, for example, exploring the effect of a specific change on a digital preservation system. So the linked resource model, or LRM, approaches the environment within which digital resources are preserved as an ecosystem, which is, importantly, dynamic rather than static. It aims to describe those objects relevant to preservation within an ecosystem rather than the whole ecosystem, and it focuses on representing digital objects, their dependencies, and temporal evolution. Change over time is central to the model, and it recognizes that not only are the digital objects themselves subject to change, but so too is the technological and social context uh, within which they are used. Dependencies are another core part of the model, and they include not only the obvious technical dependencies, such as software or hardware, uh, but also uh, dependencies on other entities, such as organizations, roles, uh, policies, uh, and other elements. Once dependencies are modeled, the uh, model can then be used in a variety of ways, uh, such as risk analysis, um, <coughs> assessing the impact of various types of change, uh, or of implementing uh, various policies, such as, for example, uh, migration. The LRM model features a uh, number of individual components, uh, including uh, resource, agent, activity, uh, dependency, and description. These components are then extended by the domain ontologies to better reflect the specific nature of the individual domains. And the LRM model was explicitly developed to be extensible in this way. So the LRM model represents the objects being preserved as resources. Uh, these can be of three types. Uh, an abstract resource is a conceptual representation of an entity, uh, which could be the concept or intention behind an artwork, while a concrete resource is the concrete realization of an abstract resource. And the third type is an aggregated resource, which is a resource made up of multiple other resources. Agents are the bearers of change within the model, uh, something that brings change to a resource or which participates uh, in an activity. Uh, and an activity is a temporal entity uh, which represents uh, an event. And this can be extended to obviously to represent different types of event. Uh, dependencies are the association, uh, relation or interaction among two or more resources. Uh, while a description gives information about a resource, um, such as what it is or why it exists. Uh, these components can then all be extended to reflect the requirements of a particular domain. Uh, within Pericles, the different use cases that we covered earlier uh, are each developing their own domain ontologies uh, based on the linked resource model. Um, work on the LRM within Pericles has been done by our partners uh, at Xerox, uh, and the domain ontologies have been developed by SURF. To illustrate this, um, here is an example from the domain ontology for software-based art. Um, I should say this is very much a work in progress, uh, but it does at least represent our current, the state of our current thinking. And this slide gives examples of how components from the LRM have been extended. So agent has been extended to include the subclasses of uh, human agent and software agent. Uh, activities have been extended to include multiple types of activity, uh, which can then themselves be further refined so migration is a subclass of conservation activity, 
um, which is itself a subclass of activity. <coughs> dependency has been extended to include the subclasses hardware dependency, software dependency, and data dependency, um, the last of which is the requirement for data, knowledge, or information from human input or from configuration files and so forth. Of particular relevance to this domain, the ontology also includes the modeling of intention, uh, including conceptual intention, which represents the meaning of the artwork given by its creator and the way the artist meant for the artwork to be interpreted or understood, and functional intention, which represents relations that affect the proper uh, functioning of the artwork. As an example, this slide shows a hardware dependency modeled using the domain ontology for software-based art. The diagram shows a hardware dependency for the artwork Becoming, which Anna mentioned earlier, and shows how the modeling of the hardware dependency includes the relationships between the hardware dependency itself, the artwork, the specification for the display of the artwork, and the intention behind the display. So one potential way of working with ontologies that we are exploring within Pericles uh, is to use a tool developed within the project. The Pericles extraction tool is designed to extract key information on a system's environment uh, and also on files and on changes to files. Uh, it is based on the sheer curation principle. Uh, that is, it can capture information from a live system and it requires no intervention uh, from that system's user. Uh, it can be easily adapted to fit a variety of different uh, scenarios. Uh, and the tool was developed by our partners at the University of Liverpool and at Göttingen State and University Library. Uh, it is open source uh, and available now on GitHub. And the tool has the potential to supply some of the information that is required to populate an ontology, um, which hopefully will make ontologies uh, more accessible. So developing an ontology requires a detailed understanding of what one is modeling. And the process of developing these ontologies has been extremely valuable for Tate and has helped to clarify our thinking about the relationship between significant properties and dependencies. And one valuable outcome for us has been that this development work has very much helped to highlight areas which we now realize require further research. But we're also thinking about uh, potential uses um, of ontologies beyond Tate uh, in the wider sector and indeed in other sectors. Ontologies may offer a different way of thinking about issues in digital preservation um, that are commonly managed by metadata schemas uh, and the differences between these two approaches have raised some interesting questions. And the workers also involved in developing ontologies can be significant uh, and we are thinking about the possibilities of a community-based approach to developing shared and open ontologies uh, for particular domains. And this has the potential to encourage discussion, uh, to share knowledge and understanding, as well as identifying areas for further research. Which brings me to the close. I'd just like to end um, with a little plug for a conference that is being held at Tate uh, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, which is focusing on the interaction of media art uh, and technological change over time. Uh, and which I hope will be of interest to uh, many of you here today. So, thank you. <laughs>